carry on. I'm not actually, Andrew will now come in and push me off stage and do the real <laughs> So basically, yes, it, it's a well known UFO story in Britain. It's become Britain's Roswell. And over the years, since 1974 when it took place, effectively what's happened is, is a very mountain UFO legend has sprung up. So what you've got is you've got a legend, which if you go on the internet and type Bowen Mountain UFO case in, you'll get probably about 15 to 20,000 uh, websites, all of which will tell you some story about the Bowen Mountain case. Most, 99% of these stories will revolve around the fact that a UFO was alleged to have crashed there. That is the Bowen Mountain UFO legend, repeated endlessly in, in books, uh, newspapers, uh, magazines, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I've been investigating the case now since... Oh, 1991 or something like that, and originally, when I gave my first talk about it um, at an FT unconvention several years ago, about 10, 12 years ago now, I, some of you were here, there, I'm sure, I concluded that I completely solved the case, and it was all down to a complicated series of misperceptions. Um, yeah, we've got the birds, but we don't need the birds, I need that screen there, which is what worked this morning when we did it. They're very nice at fighting buzzards. Don't go neither, don't you? Fantastic bird. <laughs> um, so yes, you've got this legend, which is what people think it is. It's not that at all. What I'm going to tell you today is the true story of the Bowie Mountain UFO case, but instead of it all being completely explained as I once thought it was, um, I've gone back on my original statement and I'm now fairly confident that at least one central part of it is still unexplained and this makes the case very interesting indeed. I don't believe for a minute it was extraterrestrials, um, but uh, there's something very strange going on and I do need the slides now because <coughs> I, need to, uh, I need to say that before I unravel the case I'm going to give you a quote from Edward Curtis, the famous ethnographer, I'm sure you read him on a nightly basis, who, after writing a 20-volume history of the North American Indians, concluded, but we don't know until he comes up on the slide, do we? <laughs> no, that should be on there, and it's not on there. And yet this morning, when we did the run-through, that was on there. Thus, something is missing. Bits of it. We haven't got it all, and also the, one of the um, screens has vanished. <laughs> <laughs> the settings are exactly the same as what this morning we did the run through. This is a standard technical. Um, <laughs> And in fact, the ethnographer himself said, I am beginning to believe nothing is quite so uncertain as the facts. And you might wish to bear this in mind when either reading my book or when weighing up the various witness accounts of this or any other account of anomalous phenomena. You must also remember that whatever happened on the Burwin Mountains took place 36 years ago now. And although I and other people have been interviewed, interviewing several of the principal witnesses in intervening years, in the end, Telling the story of the past requires the researcher to assemble as much information as is available and make a judgment as to what really occurred. The best historians and researchers can do to combat the corrosive effects of time on people's recollections is to emphasise those accounts that were recorded as close to the event as possible. But people are strange and can easily confuse facts, times and chronologies, especially when they have been exposed to other versions of events they were involved in. So the best we can do really is to look for supporting evidence for people's claims and to weigh them against other accounts. And I'm a great believer in the concept of the paper trail. And by that, I mean that events leave a trail of paper, both official and unofficial. And if these can be collated and analysed and then matched with witness and other interviews, it's usually possible to come up with an approximation of what really happened. 
So, the Bourbon events are confusing, very confusing. There's an awful lot of detail. I can't, I can't promise going into every bit of the detail. I'll be whisking through it, basically, in the 50 minutes or so I've got. So if you don't understand that we should discuss anything with me, find me and ask me later on or tomorrow. But most of all, buy the book, because that's what we'll tell you. First of all, a few facts. Oh, right. It was shortly before 10 o'clock last night that North Wales Police Headquarters at Colwyn Bay began receiving a spate of 999 calls from people over a wide area reporting a loud explosion somewhere near Colwyn. There was even one report of an earth tremor being felt as far away as Hoy Lake on the Wirral in Cheshire. At first, police suspected an aeroplane might have crashed, but checks with RAF Valley and civil airport authorities soon ruled this out. Search parties were being organised when the Coast Guard at Hollyhead reported having seen a bright white flash speeding across the sky at about that time. Coast Guards in the Bristol Channel and Isle of Man confirmed that they too had spotted bright lights, green and blue, moving in an easterly direction. But what about the local people? What did they see and hear? These are real people. <laughs> Did you try to trace where it might have landed? Did you think it was a meteorite? No, at first uh, I, I thought it was just an experiment you know, going on. We heard it about 15 to 9, 10 to 9, roughly that is. And it seemed to come right on the top of the head. We thought the house was coming down. And then the floor shook and the copper and the... Uh, things on the television, jumping and bang about here. Because we were a lot of thunder lately. We were a lot of thunder lately. There were lights coming from the top of the mountain, up over there. And um, all people were out of the offices and realised that everybody had had this. Did it give you a fright? No, I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> well, within myself, I'm, I'm completely open. I don't really know what it was. It might have been a, a strange coincidence, an earth tremor, people seeing light at the same time, perhaps. But uh, certainly, uh, it sounds, with all the reports that have come in, that there definitely was something. What it was, we're not sure. Well, what happens next? Are you going to keep searching? Uh, not until we get more information. Uh, we'll be going back now to the police station, update what information we've got, and if, in fact, uh, they have something new for us, uh, we will go on search. And, but at the moment, I should think the search will be called off. So it is possible that this incident may always remain a mystery? Certainly seems like it. Uh, I'd like to know the answer when it does come. Uh, that was uh, one of the many uh, TV <laughs> coverage things that happened the, uh, the morning after. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about the Berwyn Mountains, and just to show you where they are, that's basically the Berwyn Mountains there. You can see you've got North Wales around there, Chester and Telford. Um, if we zoom in a little bit, because I'll be talking about these places, the key locations are, are a village called Clandrithlow and a village called Clandervel. Ballow comes into it as well, and those are the Berwyn Mountain peaks there. Uh, some of you will know the area, some of you won't. Uh, if you read anything about the Berwyn Mountain legend, you see that several people say and state categorically that in the days and weeks prior to the event, um, the military had some knowledge that a UFO was going to crash or come down on the mountains, and they were searching for it by helicopter. This has become part of the Burwee Mountain legend, and if you read the newspapers from 1973 and 74, you'll see there's a huge wave of um, phantom helicopters. This is a typical headline, uh, phantom copter as mystery has police baffled. Hundreds were seen all across the north of England, and especially in the, the run-up towards the Burwee Mountain um, events of January 23rd, 1974. And those who saw them said they appeared to be looking for something, and this has crept into the myth. But I, I can assure you that other than the rumour, there is actually no connection between these sightings of mystery helicopters and the events at Berwyn later in the month. And some of the other news clippings of the time sort of may give the game away because somebody very perceptively 
came up with the idea that the helicopter may be just an illusion, and that all these lights that had been seen across the north of England were, in effect, a type of UFO, misperceptions of um, bright stars, planets, aircraft, and another strange light. No actual helicopter was found to account for the, the bizarre flying patterns of these things. Yet it's crept into the story by a soldier who, who we meet later on in the, um, in the story. So, Wednesday, 23rd of January 1974, was just another winter's day in Bala, in the nearby villages of Llandrithlo and Landerfell. I pronounced that wrong, but just to test you. Uh, the weather was cold and wet, with patches of snow still clinging to the nearby Bowie Mountains, and UFOs were the last thing on the minds of the villagers who were engaged in their everyday business. But as darkness closed in, a series of events took place that was to change all that, and which had far-reaching effects, and effects which are still being discussed in the area over 36 years later. Shortly after 8.30pm, there was a huge rumbling noise, which lasted four or five seconds. This was followed immediately by a huge explosion. Furniture moved, uh, ornaments fell off their, their ledges, pictures were smashed, and buildings shook. Livestock ran around and did sort of frightened livestock noises. <laughs> We haven't got a tape of that here sometime. <laughs> Literally thousands of people in the area flooded into the streets to scan the night skies to find out what was going on. Uh, they, they just flooded into the squares, came out of the pubs, they had no idea what had happened. Many vividly recall a huge white and green light streaking across the heavens. Others saw a brilliant flash of light and some said a fire could be seen up on the mountain. And as these lights died slowly away, looking towards the mountains, bright fingers of light probing vertically into the night sky could be seen. In Landrithlo, drinkers flooded from the local pub, which is the Dudley Arms, um, and went out into the streets. Hundreds of people phoned the police in Colwyn Bay from this phone box, a very famous <laughs> phone box, the most famous phone box in North Wales on that night. I'm sure they were queuing to use it to report what had happened. One of, those, one of the first who used the phone box was the local village <coughs> policeman, PC, PC Owen. His call was received by Colwyn Bay Police HQ at 9 o'clock. And this is a verbatim extract from what he said, and I heard it. <coughs> there was a terrific explosion. I heard it. There was a flashing light upon the Cadabronwyn. It could be a crashed aircraft. The beams of light had disappeared when Owen left the phone box, so he did the sensible thing, went back to the pub. <laughs> it was later interviewed by seismologists a few days after the event. And you can see his, the, these are handwritten notes <coughs> taken by field investigators from the <coughs> British Geological Survey who interviewed him about two days after the event. And you probably can't read them from there, but basically you can tell from the notes that he was of the opinion a plane had crashed. And in fact the majority of the people in the area were of the opinion that a plane had crashed. Because what else could they think they imagine it could be? Um, and as you will see, it was this belief which led to someone wit witnessing an anomaly which lies at the heart of the Berwyn events. And there are hundreds of other accounts just like uh, PC Owens, some of which I've, re I've uh, recreated in the book. So, for the first thing to do with the Berwyn case is to examine what caused the noise, the rumbling, the explosions, and what caused the almost simultaneous light seen overhead. Well, if you look on the internet and read some people's books and look at the legend, you'll see that people believe that the noise and the lights was the UFO coming into Earth and crashing on the mountains, and that was the noise that was heard. And really, that's not the case at all, appealing where it might seem to some people. The noise was an earth tremor, and the flash of light and the lights in the sky, seen by PCO and others, was a bolide meteor. And obviously you say, yeah, Andy, you're saying that, but prove it. Well, I can't prove it because we can't go back to that night, but I think I can prove it by um, other methods. Uh, and we'll get to the, the interesting bit of the case later on, but this needs to be dealt with first. The facts are, and these are all taken from official records, um, at 8.39pm exactly, seismographs in several locations uh, recorded an earthquake of between 3.5 and 4 on the Richter scale. And this is, this is the actual readout that, that I've done a photocopy here. Now, had it, this was recorded in the Edinburgh region. Had it been a, uh, something crashing to earth, it would have had to have been something like the size of Manchester crashing into, into the mountains to, to have this effect at that distance. Um, here's a short DVD with someone from the British Geological Survey talking about it. The British Geological Survey's observatory had measured a quake with a magnitude of 3.5 on the Richter scale. The epicenter was just a mile from Clandrichla. The Earth's tremor explained the shaking ground and could also have been responsible for the explosive sound. 
Many witnesses heard not only a rumbling, but an actual explosion, as if something had hit the ground hard. That too was an effect of the earthquake, and here's Roger Musson of the British Geological Society survey to explain a little bit more about how earthquakes are perceived by humans. In all British earthquakes, often people say that the, 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 the sound is more terrible than the shaking. What happens is that when these shock waves reach the surface of the earth, a certain amount of them um, change from being shock waves travelling through the ground to shock waves travelling through the air as sound. So what you get is a booming sound or a rumbling sound. These are often very widely reported. So far from being a localised impact, as would have been the case if a plane or even UFO crashed, it was um, an earth tremor. And you can see here the distribution map of where it was felt. Each of these little, little dots, as you can see, indicates how it was felt. And you can see it was felt as far north as Liverpool and, um, and above Liverpool, as far west as Holyhead, as far east as Telford, and as far south as, as the Barmouth area. Um, Three, several studies have been carried out into the Berwyn earthquake and they've worked out three separate locations for its epicentre, all of which are very, very near. You can see Bala there, um, Landrithlo there, three separate locations. That one's the most interesting because it is directly above this stone circle called Mol i Uchaf. Uh, on the slopes of, of Cadabronwen. Now, Paul Devere, I don't know if Paul's in the audience, probably not, uh, but Paul Devere initially thought that perhaps what had caused the, um, the Berman events was some form of earth light, and that's what people had seen. And that's still a theory. I, I, I discount it, but uh, this, this film circle comes into play later on. Um, but the point is, the noise and the rumbling was caused by an earthquake and not by something hitting the ground. Um, Science has con conclusively proved that. But what are the flashes of light seen on the mountains by PCO and others? And what are the lights seen streaking overhead at the same time as what we now know is the quake? Well, unfortunately, this was pre-digital camera era, so no one actually took a picture of the, uh, the aerial phenomena at the time. But there are numerous descriptions, and one of the best by far is that of Annie Williams. Mrs. Annie Williams and Mrs. Elizabeth Hughes described what they experienced as being like something out of Doctor Who. On feeling the tremor, they rushed from their bungalow at Brew Dinham. Mrs. Williams later telling The Guardian, I saw this bright light hanging in the sky. It had a long fiery tail which seemed to be sparking off small stars. It seemed to be motionless for several minutes, going dim and very brilliant, like a dormant fire which keeps coming to life. It would have been like an electric light bulb in shape, except it seemed to have rough edges and then fell somewhere behind the hills at the back of my bungalow, and the earth shook. That doesn't sound much like a UFO flying saucer, but it does sound very much like a meteor. And for those people who've never seen a meteor, they're absolutely amazing natural spectacles. Even the lesser ones are magnificent. The one seen over the Bergens on the 23rd of January 1974 was an outstanding example of the phenomenon. Imagine the experience of hearing a terrible rumbling and explosion followed within a few seconds by the sight of a bolide meteor like this one. To the film taken in America or of a bullied meteor. And if you read the newspaper descriptions of what the villagers saw, effectively they were describing a huge bullied meteor streaking overhead and breaking up above them, appearing to crash into the mountains because it went down over the mountains. This meteor was later tracked going out over um, the North Sea by Holyhead Coast Guards. And then, there you go, that's it, that's, that's an American one. Um, but you're thinking, yeah, but what about the flashes of light seen by numerous witnesses? And some of them said, uh, well, you've just seen it there, it's just happened. That's another, another bow I meet, it's showing how it can light up the entire landscape. I think it might do it again. Yeah, there you go, a flash of a meteor exploding, it lights up the landscape as day. Uh, and there were several meteors that night in the, in the Bowmans, at least one of which lit up the landscape like day. So, not UFOs, perfectly natural phenomenon. So you're thinking, yeah, alright Andy, there might have been an earthquake, there might have been a meteor at the same time, but isn't it so, too much of a coincidence to have a huge earthquake and a spectacular meteor within a few seconds of each other? Well, no, not really, it isn't, because if you think about it, the multiverse is a wonderful place and time is long. We know quakes exist and we know that meteors exist. It would actually be more odd if occasionally the two just don't combine to put on a spectacular show for anyone around to watch it. 
The Fortean philosopher, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, Charles Fort, there he is on a bit of a walking holiday in the Berwings, <laughs> um, writing in his book, The Lands, records several incidences of earthquakes accompanying bull-like meteors. And if the idea that a simultaneous earthquake and a meteor could lead people to believe a UFO had crashed, then an event from October 1661 might put things in perspective, because following an earthquake and sightings of, quote, monstrous flaming things in the sky, a Mrs. Margaret Petmore reputedly went into labour and, quote, brought forth three male offspring, all of whom had teeth and spoke at birth. <laughs> Did that really happen? Well, it was reported as having done so in the newspapers, pretty much like the Berwyn events. So, but as with the Berwyn UFO mountain legend, there is no evidence other than rumour in support of it. UFOs and aliens were not part of the 17th century's catalogue of wonders, but freakish births were. Each age, it seems, interprets the unknown in a way that is culturally acceptable. <laughs> anyway, meteors crop up again later in our story. But for now we must move to some events which are even stranger than the lights and noise, and which form, to my mind anyway, the central part of the Berwyn Mountain UFO mystery. By the time of the, of the events, the locals of the area of the Berwyn Mountains have no idea that the combination of an earthquake and meteor was responsible. The vast majority believed an aircraft had crashed. And one of those people trying desperately to get through to the police was a nurse from nearby village of Pandavel. This was a nurse called Pat Evans. And here's where the story gets interesting and complicated. Um, there you go, that's Landavel, and Pat Evans was just watching television um, when the earthquake kicked off, and she tried for about 40 minutes to get through to the police. And eventually she got through to the police at Colwyn Bay. Now, if you read Jenny Randall's books, for instance, you'll find that she says it was the police who suggested that Pat drove up onto the mountain road. But in fact, it was Pat Evans herself who offered to go. Because she was a nurse, she suggested to the police that if an aircraft had crashed, as a trained nurse, she could get there before the emergency services and offer any help to any survivors. And of course they said, well, you do what you want to do. It's not up to us, we don't know anything's crashed. And so, loading her two daughters into the car, she set off into the miserable winter's night, <coughs> a night that would change her life forever. And here's where a case I thought previously ex easily explained by earthquake and meteors gets very complicated indeed. So setting off, Pat drove from Pandavel, and in fact she went... Down that road there, uh, down that road there, down that road there. She came onto a shortcut at that road there, and she came out on the mountain road at that point. Had it been light, that's the view she would have seen as, as she came onto the top of the mountains. That's the Burmese mountains there. The road disappears off down the other side there. Um, the night was black, pitch black. There was no moon or stars. Some drizzle was falling, but the outline of the mountains were clear. Had it been daylight, that's what she would have seen as she drove across the B4391. Keen to get to the site of what she believed was an air da disaster, as she drove, she was scanning the mountains ahead of her for any signs of light. And once she reached the summit of the deserted mountain road, she halted, astonished at what she could see. Because there, high on the barren mountainside, was a huge glowing ball of light. And this is an artist's impression of, of what Pat Evans saw. That's the, that's the moon for comparison, even though it wasn't out, and that's the glowing ball of light. Pat described the ball of light as being about half the size of the moon, which, if you think about it, as a 40 year measurement, is pretty big. Um, she, she, she stopped the car and looked at it, uh, stand, just stood there with, with her daughters in the car. Whatever it was, it was too far from the road to be reached on foot. So she watched it, flabbergasted, as the ball of light slowly pulsated changing colour from red to yellow to white and back again. It was unusual, to say the least. There were no flames, and whatever it was didn't look like what she expected an air disaster to resemble. So the nurse and her daughters could only stare, mystified at the scene before them. And then it got stranger. As she viewed this astonishing sight, the nurse could see other lights near it. Some were small, like torches, and others were like those of a vehicle, moving around and toward the huge light on the hillside. We know a great deal about Pat Evans' sighting because she was interviewed a few days later by the seismologist from the British Geological Society, an interview which produced two pages of notes. <coughs> Nurse Evans gave a statement to the British Geological Survey in 1974, which only came to light in the 1980s. And I tracked these documents down in the British Geological Society's files in Edinburgh and was amazed at what was on it. It was a two-page statement 
And there you can see she gives a, a quick, uh, large, perfect circle, <laughs> like a big bonf bonfire. You can see lights above and to the right. Four, uh, I don't know if that's four or two vehicle lights moving to bottom. And that's what either she drew or the BGS people drew at her behest. So you've got a huge red ball, torch lights above it, vehicle or vehicles before, below it. The second page of the notes um, reveals even more detail, especially about the time Pat set off, which means we can determine with some certainty what time she set off and what time she was looking at the lights, and that's crucial to try and understand what else was happening. Pat's sighting is the central mystery of the Burley Mountain UFO case, but it's fraught with problems, and I shall now attempt to explain. Firstly, there's the problem of exactly where the unusual light was seen when she was interviewed. She told the seismologists, you know, what she'd seen and everything, but unfortunately they only recorded where she was parked. And they did this by marking her location onto a master map of witnesses to the earthquake and related phenomenon. This is the master map uh, with, with my additions to it. Now, Pat was parked there at point C100 on the, uh, the B4391 road. If you look very carefully, you can see a line drawn on the map that goes right across from her sighting to point C64. And this is a crucial, um, a crucial area. So we know exactly, to within a few minutes, what time she saw it, and I'll explain how we, do, we, know, we know that in a moment. Um, she drove half a mile or so to the county boundary and returned to point C100. Whatever it was was still there. And whatever it was, she was baffled, unable to identify what she was looking at. And so, realising she was too far away to be of any practical assistance, she set off from her, for home. Mystified by what she had seen, and again, if you read the legend, read the books, this is the story you'll get. She set off down the mountain road, and several ufologists have claimed that on the journey back down the mountain road to her village, she saw vehicles ahead of her on the road, and was surprised to be flagged down and stopped by a group of police and soldiers. They were clearly unhappy at seeing her there and forcefully ordered her off the mountain, telling her the road was now cordoned off and all members of the public were banned from it. I mean, that's fantastic stuff. If you're a believer in extraterrestrials and you hear a story like that, you think, yeah, conspiracy, they warned her off good. But that didn't happen either. Unfortunately, it's nonsense. It stems from an interview Pat gave to a ufologist called Margaret Fry in 1985, allegedly. Unfortunately, Margaret Fry didn't take, take the interview and just believed that Pat had told her that she'd been stopped. But this piece of inf misinformation was picked up on by a few ufologists, notably Jenny Randalls, who repeated it widely in a number of books and magazines, not least UFO retrievals. This was the book which really brought the Berwyn events into the public eye, and Jenny's claim that Pat had been stopped by police and military cemented the idea that there was a cover-up of something, and that something was the military retrieval of a downed UFO. And Jenny wrote in it, police and military forces who had being even closer to the object, passed her on the way down the mountain. She explained why she was, why she was there and something about what was happening. And nobody answered her questions except to say she would have to leave. No one unauthorised was allowed up there, so they escorted her <coughs> off the mountain. Because she was afraid for her daughter's safety, she did not argue. So basically, you've got a classic conspiracy there, there, there about the authorities who know all about a crash, they don't like people being up there, and they order her off the mountain. If she'd have been in the military, they would have said, you're off the mountain, your pension stop. There are many variations on, on, uh, on this myth. Um, and of course, I interviewed Pat, I think I'm the only ufologist to actually interview her on tape, in uh, early 1998, and she stated unequivocally to me that she didn't see a living soul. I didn't see a soldier or a policeman, I saw no one. And that's Pat Evans standing at the exact spot where she was parked at, and pointing across to where she saw the, um, the light somewhere around there. And again, this is fraught with, with, with difficulties. The whole Pat Evans situation is confusing, but it is the central mystery of the Berwyn events. What could Pat have seen, and why didn't anyone else see it? The simple answer <coughs> is, now, to me, I don't know. I used to think I knew, but I don't. But there are perhaps some clues. At the same time Pat Evans was phoning the police and contemplating travelling up the mountain road, Two other groups of people were becoming involved in the night's events. Immediately after the earth tremor at 8.39, Inspector Glyn Evans, based at the Dolgeth Police Station some 20 miles away, set off at speed to the Ballar area. He stopped at Ballar Police Station and discussed the situation with Police Sergeant Elvin Roberts. They set off for Landrithlo in the Ballar Police van. 
When they reached Landry Flow, it's about 9.20, they found the village in an uproar, with puzzled villagers thronging the streets, trying to understand what had taken place. After conferring with the village policemen, Evans and Roberts decided they needed to take a look on the mountain themselves. But as they had neither the local knowledge nor a suitable vehicle, they decided to commandeer one. And here's where the story of Pat Evans possibly intertwines with that of the police and several other characters. What follows is just an overview of this complex part of the case, which because it is the core of the Bowen events, occupies two chapters in the book that you're all going to buy after this event. <laughs> so, these two police officers took some local police officers in uh, one or two cars, and they drove up... Oh, see, Pat Evans, she thinks it's great. <laughs> um, so, driving from the centre of Landrithlo, the police officers drove up this road here, which is a dead-end forestry track. When they got to a farm called Garthian, which is there, um, they stopped. And at Garthian Farm, 14-year-old Hugh Thomas was watching TV with his elderly neighbour, Enoch. His parents were out. Um, he answered the door to the police, who told him, quote, We want to commandeer your Land Rover. And he agreed to drive them up to the mountainside in his Land Rover. There is some confusion as to whether one or two Land Rovers went up. One witness who will come to shortly believes there were two, but there was certainly one, full of police. The police and farmer's son drove up the tarmac track, which is tarmac to about there in the trees, and they had to stop a few moments about there, because a car was blocking the road, and this car's quite crucial. The car and its occupants um, hold some sort of understanding to the case. The car belonged to local poachers. The local police who were with the police from Bala knew this because they recognised the car and they all knew each other, very, very sort of localised area. The poachers had been up on this area, this plateau area here, lamping, uh, which is a technique whereby they go out with guns and a dog and a car battery um, strapped to a car headlamp and they shine the lamp into the um, eyes of um, rabbit or, in this case, they were hunting snipe, which, which is a ground bird that, that zooms off into the air, so they, they would have been going like that with their lights, and then shooting it. Um, but the poachers had seen the police coming up, abandoned the car, and ha hid behind the wall, because they didn't recognise the police who weren't from Landrithlo. The significance here is that one of the poachers came forward two years two years ago, and told of how he and his colleagues had been out hunting <coughs> Powell fell lamps at the time of the earthquake, and they were on the plateau above Landrithlo, somewhere around there. The beams of light seen by the villages in Landrithlo, which is effectively sort of down that way now, um, are almost certainly where the poachers' lamps were, were shining as they flushed out hares, rabbits and snipe, because they had penetrating beams of light that were shining up in the air. It's a huge um, plateau with a steep drop down into the village, so that basically all the villagers would see it were lights coming up like that. Um, having moved the purchase car, the police and farmer's son continued up the steep forestry road to the mountain gate, as it's called. And it's a gate that goes onto a mountain, so they're, they're adapted in Wales, they know how to describe things. Mountain gatey eye, I think it probably is. Um, yes, gas with astonishment. But I live in Wales, I can say these things. Um, and those are the Bowen Mountains above there. They opened the gate and went through out onto the mountainside in one or two Land Rovers with some police on foot. And the landscape opens out to reveal the foothills of Cadabron, which you can see above. So, let's try and make some sense of this. We know that Pat Evans the nurse was on the mountain road just after 10pm at point C100. Uh, which, so you've got Pat Evans there at just after 10pm. We know from the timings that the police and poachers were at the mountain gate around 10pm. Just before 10pm, but for, for about 20 minutes later they were, they were all there. And we know that Pat was looking across from point 100 to an area there, which is where the police and the poachers were. Now, logic dictates that what she was seeing was something to do with the police or poachers. But the police and poachers didn't see anything at all. They had no big lights with them. So that completely mystified me. And Pat only reported that she saw one set of vehicles and torchlights. If there had been any other torches or vehicles, Anywhere in that entire area, probably, Pat would have seen them, or the police and the poachers would have seen them. Yet each group of people didn't know the others were there, and they only saw nothing, 
she only saw one set of, of lights um, across the um, across the mountainside. So the natural conclusion is that what Pat saw was something connected to police search. And the police stated that they did get out of the, <coughs> the vehicles and walked alongside them, which again is what Pat was describing. And this is one of the policemen saying what happened. No, no, it isn't. No, the uh, crucial point I've missed. Pat said that what she saw was, quote, just to the right of the Colwyn lights. Colwyn is there. Uh, personally, I suspect she was seeing the Cunwood lights. But either way, she, she said they were just to the right of those two lights. If she was there, and something was just to the right of those, it puts it again there. And that's worth bearing in mind when we talk about the other possible location. So, if what she saw was something to, the police, to do with the police and farmer's search party, why didn't they say anything at any time later? And all this would be simpler if Pat hadn't given contradictory statements as to where she believed the mysterious light was. When we were on top of the mountain, we actually used our own torches. And then there was a period when we said, right, let's put the torches out and let's just be still for a while and look around and listen. As much as we could, we tried to uh, establish if there was anything at all unusual out there. So basically that's the police officer uh, saying that um, he and his colleagues got out of the Land Rovers, walked at the side of them with torches, which is exactly what Pat had the, had the BGS drawn her, uh, her interview a couple of days after the event. Yet the police and the approaches weren't carrying big, big light and they saw no one else. And this, this has mystified me for, for, for years. And originally I thought what she'd seen was um, a lamp held by the poachers that they put on the ground and it was shining across the mountainside and she misperceived it but the poachers say they have no lamps with them like that and that they also didn't meet the police in a, in a location where she could have seen them but the first time Pat ever spoke to a ufologist was 1995 and she spoke to a, Margaret Fry they went up on the B4391 and Pat showed Margaret where she thought the huge light had been and this was a sketch drawn just after Margaret Fry had been now that's where she saw it, there with the white lights zigging round it, zigzagging round it. But that's a completely different position to where the British Geological Survey were told she saw it, and where she said to me that she'd seen it, which was over there. Uh, very, very confusing. Um, is it possible that in the intervening 21 years Pat's memory had faded? Or did Margaret draw it from memory afterwards and put it in the wrong location? Certainly the location doesn't equate with Pat's statement that it was just to the right of the Colwyn Lights. This location is well to the right, across a huge swathe of mountain. If we look at a sort of 3D model of the landscape, you'll see that's where Pat was, that's where the police uh, and farmer's lad were, which is perfectly intervisible, um, but that's the location that um, she told Margaret Fry the light was in. Now, if Pat said it was just to the right of the Colwyn Lights, as she did to the British Geological Survey a couple of days after the event, again, that's Corwin, Cunwood, you're talking about just to the right is there, not there, that's like, you know, 45 degrees to the right at, at the very least. So even though she's given two locations, I still favour this location, but that has its problems because no one said they had a light with them. Um, to further confuse matters, over the years, Pat has said the mystery object was anything from one to three miles away from her vantage point on the road. And the facts are, it was pitch black and she had no idea of landmarks or distance. She was just looking, looking across a huge <coughs> swathe of black moorland. All we can be certain about is the fact that vehicles and torchlights were close to the object, and whatever the object or light was, appeared to be very large. But, you've also got to consider, Pat was expecting to come across the crash of an aircraft. That's what she thought she was going to. She had a preconception in her mind about that. And it's entirely possible that her perceptions, looking across miles of open mountainside with no points of reference for size, enhanced <coughs> even a small light belonging to the police and farmer's lad into a large light. Possibly. We don't know that. That's not what Pat thinks. When I interviewed Pat in 1998, we drove up to the spot where she parked and she pointed to where the light had been. As far as I could ascertain then and from subsequent visits, she was pointing towards the area searched by the police and not to the area Margaret Fry believed. Which is... There, I mean, again, that's, that's, um, that's where Pat was, that's where the police, a farmer's lad was, where she told Margaret Fry it was, was somewhere down there. That's Pat pointing 
1998, and she's actually standing there, pointing to around there. So, it's a puzzle. And if any, there's no answer to it. If any of you are seriously interested in this case and wish to test my theory, you can easily locate where Pat is stood from this picture, because there's a sort of a ditch running down. The picture's reproduced in the book that you're now going to buy. Um, so you can test it out for yourself and, and work it out from all the other clues in the book. On the following day, the 24th of January, the story hit the media, and some of you might even be old enough to remember this. <laughs> Hello again. A remote area of North Wales was shaken by a mysterious explosion during the night, and no one yet knows why. Over the next few days, all the major local, regional and national newspapers and TV companies covered the Bourbon events. And now, instead of the events being attributed to a plane crash, it was now decided a combination of earthquake and meteors were responsible. Fairly typical media report uh, at the time. And that was certainly true, but neither of these things could be responsible for Pat Evans' experience. Had the Bowen events taken place in the 80s, 90s, or the first decade of this century, the media would have tagged it as a UFO case immediately, irrespective of the plausible explanations. As it was, at the time, only one newspaper mentioned UFOs, and this was the Daily Mail, two days after. And even then, it was in the context of the industrial unrest, which was causing coal shortages at the time. <laughs> but it didn't take long for rumours to start. A few days after the incident, a group of people were in the area carrying out a survey of a stone circle on the slopes of one of the Bowie Mountains. Their instruments recorded unusually high radiation readings at the stones, at the stone circle we saw earlier, in fact. Readings that could not be accounted for. Were these readings, they mused, connected in some way with the events a few days earlier on the same mountains? And the astute among you will recall that one of the locations for the earthquake's epicentre was directly under this stone circle. One local newspaper was certainly involved a crash of some kind. It didn't say what, but it did note that uh, it did note that there is a report that an army vehicle was seen coming down the mountain near Bowler Lake with a large square box in the back of it and accompanied by outriders. And yes, that, that report does exist, but it's the only one. It's been seized upon by ufologists, but it wasn't substantiated or attributed to anyone, and no other witness has ever come forward to say that they saw that. But it's been seized upon the ufologists as implying something did crash and was retrieved. Um, but no one saw anything at all. No one saw anything crash. The people were searching the mountains until 11pm on the night of the 23rd and again at 7am 7, 7 the following day. No one saw a military crash retrieval team apart, arrive, depart or be in the process of doing anything. It would have actually been impossible for such an event to take place without witnesses. <coughs> And Pat Evans um, might have seen it, but that's not what anyone else saw. But once again, ufologists come to the rescue by claiming that roads and vast areas of mountainside had cordoned off, allowing the military to retrieve whatever it was had crashed. But this, I'm afraid, is just pure fantasy. Hundreds of people were on those hills in the, in the two weeks following the events, and no part of the area was cordoned off. It was overflown by news teams, it was walked over by geologists, it was walked over by scouts hunting for what had crashed, thinking it was a meteorite, but there were no military there uh, cordoning anywhere off. Some people were unhappy that the authorities had refused to acknowledge anything unusual had taken place, and a mystery soon started to grow. Within a year of the event, UFO investigators began to receive official-looking documents from a top-secret group called Aerial Phenomena Inquiry Network, also known as APEN, very similar to the MJ-12 papers, but with a sort of a North Wales slant. Um, these official-looking documents claimed that an extraterrestrial craft had come down on the Bowens and had, had been retrieved for study by an APEN crash retrieval team. Furthermore, APEN also claimed there had been a key witness to the UFO crash who they were recommended, hip, recommending for hypnotic regression. And in 1974, the notion of hypnotic regression in ufology was virtually unknown. I mean, now it's talked about commonplace. Virtually unknown in 1974. So whoever sent these knew a little bit about um, the whole subject of ufology. I mean, it's widely believed, obviously, that these are hoax documents. But, of course, they, they provide a bedrock for people to build their conspiracy theories on. The APEN documents led to, to greater interest in the event, and by the late 1970s, ufologists had begun to reinvestigate the Birmingham incident. One of Britain's most famous UFO researchers, Jenny Randalls, was a frequent holiday visitor to the region and recalled the locals discussing military activity on the mountains in the wake of some crash-like event. These tales of UFOs intrigued Jenny, and she started to make inquiries, trying to untangle the fact from the fiction, certain that something unusual had taken place in the Bowen Mountains that January night. 
1984, when Jenny was giving a talk about UFOs at RAF Shawbury, she raised the subject of the events in the Burley Mountains and, quote, there was an awkward silence from senior personnel. <laughs> Spooky music. <laughs> Jenny initially wrote that the Earth Berwyn events could have been caused by naturally occurring earth lights or perhaps because of a military accident involving nuclear material, which she, made, she further believed after the uh, bizarre silence. They could have just been bored by a talk. <laughs> We've all been there if you've seen Jenny's lectures. <laughs> the nuclear radiation theory tied in nicely with the readings taken at the Stone Circle less than a week after the event. Further evidence of radiation was introduced into the legend in 1995 when Jenny Randalls was approached by a science correspondent from a national newspaper. He told they'd been sent by his editor to the Ballard area, only a few miles from Landry Clare and Hamdervelle, to look into a hot spot of childhood leukaemia cases. Initial speculation that the nuclear plant at Charles Vinneth was responsible proved negative. So, could the Berwyn event have involved a lost nuclear warhead, or perhaps radiation leaking from a crashed UFO? These theories were all food for thought and sustenance for rumour. And of course Roswell was mentioned, and slowly this case developed into Britain's Roswell. Another strand to the legend came in 1996, when an alleged former soldier broke his silence to speak to ufologists. He said that he knew in advance that the UFO was going to come down, and he'd been sent there in a, 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 a military convoy, where he was met by another group of soldiers who gave him a box with instructions to take it to the top secret biological warfare establishment at Port and Down in Wiltshire. Once there, the boxes were opened and the soldier was shocked to see alien bodies, and even more shocked to be told one was alive. Again, the text of all this is, is in my book. He was sworn to secrecy, but eventually couldn't bear the weight of this any longer and had to come clean and admit it all to Tony Dodd. Now, yes, I, 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 I didn't even pay you to say that, did I, Peter? Um, anyone who knows Tony Dodd's involvement in ufology will, will realise the, uh, the um, stupendous import of the fact that he chose to nick Tony Dodd. Uh, you look at it another way, would the, the authorities, if they were trying to cover something up, let someone drive alien bodies from North Wales to Port and Down, <coughs> then let them see the box being opened? I very much don't think so. I think helicopters would have been involved and no one would have known what was in it at all. <coughs> and of course, none of these stories, APEN, the radiation leaks, or the soldiers' revelations, have any proof attached to them. But ufology doesn't thrive on proof, it thrives on rumour. And the growing rumours led to UFO researchers turning their attentions onto the Bowman UFO in, 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 in earnest. Some claimed the events were Britain's Roswell and that people were covering things up. They couldn't find any paper trail, they couldn't find the MOD papers, and they thought that they'd been, they'd been trashed to, to stop them getting to the truth. But the point is there never was an MOD file on the case because it wasn't reported as a, as a UFO until ufologists decided it was a UFO. There is a file now in existence which reports some meteor sightings of, of the type I've talked about earlier, and there's a lot of correspondence from some very strange <coughs> people uh, demanding that the MOD wheel the UFO out. Um, Yes, the police records in the area weren't available to ufologists, and ufologists said there was a cover-up. And yes, they were destroyed, because police policy dictated that they destroyed their record, their logs, every so often. But what the ufologists didn't know was that the British Geological Society in Edinburgh had a copy of, of these documents, which, which I've accessed and have a full set of. <laughs> Nothing was hidden from anyone. It's all there if you can be bothered to go and find it. Most ufologists can't be bothered. <laughs> But despite this, some ufologists in the media wouldn't let the case drop, and it's been rehashed repeatedly and over and over again, like this, the Baller incident, a case of Mulder and Sculder, Mulder and Scully. Um, and some investigators suspected that there was more than a cover-up. They believed some elements in the UFO community, those researchers who claimed the Bowman case was nothing more than misperception, had been placed there by MI5 to publish disinformation. Because television and radio documentaries have been made and some of the believers have been interviewed, but yet their contributions never ended up on television. So ergo, it must be a plot by the state. And the, the fingers were keen to point about who was behind this. Now, I prefer to base my assumptions and conclusions on solid documentary evidence, but then as an MI5 agent, I would, wouldn't I? Because yes, <laughs> it is all true. In late 2009, I was outed on the internet by UF UK ufologist Dick Hall, or Dick All, as I prefer to call him, <laughs> as being part of a crack MI5 disinformation team that exists to stop ufologists getting to the truth about the Burmese Mountain UFO. <coughs> and I have to tell you, there are two other MI5 agents here today that were named by Dick Hall. <laughs> David Clark sat down there, was fingered as being one of Mark Pilkington, that evil bastard. He's <laughs> <laughs> one of them as well. And this is what was written. 
Andy Roberts' ambition in life has been to try and explain away all UFO cases as anything but extraterrestrial in nature. Why would somebody without the sponsorship or backing of a funding organisation do nothing except try and criticise and pour cold water on the researcher's work? Well, because it's fun. <laughs> in the past, there has been disinformation put out about the Bergen case, probably by government MI5. Because of these incidents, we know the authorities are paranoid about what happened at Bergen in 1974. If one couples this fact with the fact that Roberts has spent more effort in trying to debunk this case than any other, you are left with the realisation that he has been... He must be being supported by the same people that have been preventing BBC members from talking about the case. We believe Roberts has been steered by the MI5 disinformation program. I'm so steered that I have to work 9 to 5 every day and I have no pension or savings or house. <laughs> but that's how much I believe in the UK government. So, there you have it. I'm an MI5 agent simply because I want to solve UFO cases and I'm prepared to spend time and money doing so. You couldn't make it up, could you? Except for Dick could. <laughs> and a lot of people believe this. It's still going round and round on the internet as a, as a point of discussion. Mark Pilkington has had an effect on his life because Mark wants to travel to Iran with his girlfriend and he can't because he knows that the Iranian authorities will check his name on the internet and they'll find a whole wealth of information claiming he's an MI5 agent. He would never come back if he went. <laughs> that, but that's the damage that these fuckwits, to put it very well, can do. This is where people are so stupid who can't investigate properly can actually damage people's lives. Lives. So, there we have it, really. The legend of the Berwyn UFO um, mountain case is more alive today than ever. Some people, it was just the, some people believe it was the crash and retrieval of an alien spaceship. Others that it was just a legend which grew from a complicated series of events involving an earthquake coupled with a particularly bright meteor shower. As I've noticed, neither of these explains all elements of the case, especially Pat Evans' sighting of a huge stationary ball of light on the mountainside. For a long time I was convinced that Pat had seen a poacher's lamp placed stationary on the floor when the police met the poachers. The recent research has shown that that's not possible, so I've had to change my mind, because my MI5 handlers told me I had to. <laughs> I've only just scratched the surface of the Burning Mountain case today, and concentrated quickly on the main points, and obviously anyone interested in a more in-depth look should immediately <laughs> dash out and buy my book before it's sold out. I see one person's going now, he wants to be first in the queue, <laughs> wise man. If something unusual really did happen on that winter's night 36 years ago, the key to it lies in Pat Evans' sighting. She's as mystified now as she was then, and I'd like to leave you with two quotes from Pat. Um, the first is taken from my 1998 interview when she said, I kept thinking we'd be told, and the mystery deepened because you're not told. And the second one is from a couple of months ago when she received a copy of, uh, of my book, which incidentally she recommends. <laughs> And she said, I know what I saw, but not what it was. Maybe we're not meant to know everything. Thank you very much. We're going to go the story later. I think we could probably do ten minutes or so of questions. We've got them. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to tell you that MI5 have been putting around a rumour that Andy would like you to buy his book. <laughs> 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 out, secrets out. <laughs> and I got that directly from, you know, the tent's house. <laughs> okay, any questions? Lady at the back. What do you think you meant for the radiations coming out of this whole circle? Um, I, I don't know because the people who were, t were testing, they, they were taking um, radiation level samples and they didn't take any background radiation level samples in the area, so there's nothing actually to, to test them against. Yes, they may have been high in the um, archaeologist's opinion, but because they haven't got anything to test them against, that, that doesn't mean anything. Have they been retested ever since? No, not, not to my knowledge. You know, no one's ever bothered to do that. I mean, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that, that, that um, the ancients may have built stone circles on, on points that have some um, geophysical energies. I don't discount that for a minute, but I don't think that has got anything to do with the, the Bowie Mountain UFO legend. But it is worth following up by someone, I think. Sir? Uh, just following on from that, um, what's the rock type of the Berwins? Um, yeah. it's, um, it's a granity substance. I just mentioned that because earth tremors in, in granitic rock can lead to release of radon. 
Yes. Which obviously will give you an elevated um, radioactive reading. Well, if this was, this is, if, if these measurements are taken shortly after an Earth tremor, I would be at all surprised if they've elevated radioactive that, that could well be the case, and I think people need to do some studies in it to try and verify that. Italy. You said that at the beginning that you thought it wasn't a UFO. Is that because of what you believe, or because of the fact you've covered it as you might? Looked into the um, partially both. I mean, I, I've been a ufologist since since the late seventies, and I, I never started off with a, with a belief in, in extraterrestrials. Uh, to me, that idea sounds preposterous. I think the world is strange enough as it is without invoking uh, things for which we've got no evidence. So I, I had a predilection, I suppose, that, that there were no aliens involved. But as soon as I looked into the case. Um, uh, well, in fact, it was my colleague Dave Clark who actually did the first work on it, and he sort of thought it might be a might be Earth-like phenomena. Then I looked into it further and was convinced that that um, that no extraterrestrials are involved because there's just no evidence at all of any nature that would pass muster in a court of law. <coughs> First, right to the back. Um, I was curious about the helicopters that you mentioned at one point. Um, what um, made you feel that they were either was, was there unreliable evidence, um, to, or was that the one that was going to the rest of the case? Or was um, I think what happened with the helicopters is whoever came up with the hoax, police, uh, hoax soldier story, as we called it, which, which I mentioned briefly, knew something about the history of ufology and knew there was this phantom helicopter flapper, as we called it, and wove that into it in retrospect. Pardon me, there was a huge phantom helicopter flap in 1973, early 74, which my colleague Dave Clark down at the front has investigated and concluded that, that no physical helicopter was responsible for more than a handful of the sites um, and that there was nothing strange. Basically what people were seeing were they were misperceiving everyday lights, aeroplanes, um, the celestial phenomena and so on and instead of framing them as UFOs they were framed as phantom helicopters. That particular time, 73 and 74, was, if you look at the newspapers, a time of great unrest in Britain where people were terrified of, of IRA attacks and there was much speculation in the press that these helicopters were smuggling in IRA guns or perhaps drugs and so on and I think we had heightened helicopter panic which has happened in other places, other, other parts of the world. Uh, Dave has published something, oh, I think it's on the internet, Dave. It's in 14 times. Oh, it's in 14 times, Dave. <laughs> 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 Where else? Um, which explains the, the phantom helicopter um, wave, which was very cleverly woven into the Bourbon myth. If you read what people actually saw, the nearest helicopter, phantom helicopters were seen several miles away. The hotbed of them was in the Pennine Hill chain around uh, Buxton in, in that area. Very strong, I'm checking around. But they probably were, yeah. yeah. So, why do you seem to discount the Earthlight idea? Because uh, I am a believer, for want of a better word, in Earthlights. I've seen them on film, uh, I've seen them created in laboratories, so I know that some form of, of um, <coughs> geophysical stress can create light. But from what I know about it, and I did co author um, Earthlight Revelation with, with Paul Devereux, um, Earthlights are transitory. Um, transient um, small phenomena, whereas what Pat Evans was seeing was a very large ball of light that was stationary for at least 10 to 15 minutes. Now, uh, Paul's not in here, unfortunately, but I'm sure if you find bombs around today and, and said, Can Earth lights last for that long? and uh, can they be that big? He would be the first to say no. So I don't discount them per se, just that they're not what caused the sighting with Pat had. Do I get a microphone? Um, I just wondered, has anyone ever pointed out that these purported UFO crashes only ever seem to occur in isolated areas? And we've never actually heard a mythology um, where there's been a whole ton of eyewitnesses and it's... Yes, we'll often about that frequently in, in sceptical ufology. When, when me and Dave meet with our MI5 handlers, we um, <laughs> <laughs> have to say, ha, ah, they believe anything, don't they? Yeah, I mean, yes, that, when you think about it, it's, it's, it's odd that they're always crashing out of the weird places. None of them have crashed on the M1, for instance, or, you know, on the outskirts of Leeds or in the middle of Glastonbury Festival, not because you've got some very good acid. <laughs> so, yes, you know, it, it's odd, isn't it? Why, why would they crash there? And in fact, I looked at, I looked at it another way. If extraterrestrials exist, which none of us can know, we must be agnostic on the matter, and they presumably come from a very long way away and have Im immensely complicated technology, so they can get here, then they fuck up and crash in a mountain. So
Um, no, really, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think in any of the, the UFO crashes there is any evidence that, that we can we can say yes, something happened, but that doesn't mean to say it's an extraterrestrial happening. And if you look at the vast majority of UFO crashes, the extraterrestrial bit has been tagged on afterwards by either hyper excitable journalists or by ufologists who think that if something happened and the military involved, but they won't tell us what it is. Ipso facto, it's a UFO crash. What about Rendlesham Forest? That can't be explained away quite so easily. Well, Rendlesham's interesting. It begins with R, and I don't talk about UFO cases that begin with R. Uh, Dave Clark is the man. He's speaking about <laughs> Rendlesham this weekend. I really, I really don't know enough to, to comment sensibly on, on Rendlesham. Something happened. People had an experience, but to me, what I've read about it, none of it adds up to a UFO event. And if you've read Mark Pilkington's book, or listen to him speak, you'll know that the, the, the government are very happy for people to believe in UFOs because it covers up their mysterious goings on quite happily without them having to do a dot of work. We do it for them. We're all working for the government. In other words. You're working for me. Yeah. I'm not a bitch. <laughs> Um, no, I don't have an explanation for it. No, but lights were seen in the sky, but what, you know, and that do, lights don't, mystery lights don't equal extraterrestrial craft, and that's the first law of ufology. Mystery lights are mystery lights. They're mystery lights. There's another person with a hand up there. Have the military ever said anything or made any comments? Um, no, because you get when people have inquired about the Blue Mountain events, they just give the standard thing that they only investigate things of defensive significance. And because the Berwyn events weren't reported to them at the time, th there was nothing to investigate. The Berwyn file, I can't remember the number of it, again, it's in the book. If you went and looked at it, it con consisted of about ten sightings of meteors throughout that evening, all of which, some of which were seen by, by the witnesses in the area, and a lot of correspondence from ufologists in the intervening years saying, please tell us everything you know about the UFO crash, where is it parked? <coughs> so, you know, it's a, the, the, the MOD UFO file is a, is a ufologist creation, in, in other words. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up. Oh, there's one more, I'll have it, I'll have this one. Do I understand you say that she took her children with her? Yes. Well, how old were they? Um, I think, off the top of my head, it was about nine and twelve. And did they see anything? Yes, they saw, they saw exactly what she saw. I, I, I've only looked at a video and I couldn't get it transferred in time, but there's a, there's a 1998 documentary from my production company called Four Winds. The episode is called Down to Earth, I think, where Pat is interviewed with her daughters and they both say they, they saw the same thing. So it wasn't just her, Pat, imagining it, it was her daughters as well. Because it's really weird, you know, if she's a nurse and she thinks there might be injured people on the mountain, that she would take her own children with her, was there nobody to leave? No, because her husband was a long distance lorry driver and he was out, um, so she, she just wanted to take them up there. And just something I didn't mention, I think, all these timings are explained meticulously in the book. In her interview with the British Geological Survey, she left the house, she said, during... Um, Till death us do well, till death it says on the notes, which is till death us do part, when the TV repairman came in. I got a copy of that episode, so I know the exact minute <laughs> that she got up to leave the house. I've driven her that route with her. I know exactly what time she was there and how long she was there. Ditto, I've used the police files to work out when the farm was and the police were there. The, ti the timing's all mesh. Ev all logic dictates that what she saw was an artifact of the police and the farmer's lad, but we can't prove that, so that's why it's still a mystery. Are we done? Yes, we are. <laughs> Thank you. Very thirsty. <laughs>